Well, good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Morton Blackwell, president of the Leadership Institute, and it is my pleasure to uh, welcome you here to our uh, Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfast. Uh, congratulations on making it through uh, the uh, third significant snowfall of the year here. Somehow we are learning to cope with global warming. Um, we live uh, in interesting times. After the 1994 elections, it took the Republican Party more than 10 years to get the uh, electorate so angry that they threw them, uh, that they lost confidence in the Republican Party and, and threw them out of control. Um, the President Barack Obama has achieved this in one year. Um, the uh, Leadership Institute had, uh, uh, tr last year set an all-time record, 22% increase over our previous record, training 11,200 students in 2009 um, in our 41 types of training schools. And uh, in, uh, in January, we trained, we trained already this year 236 students. And since 1979, the Institute has now trained more than 80,000 people, most of them students. You have uh, before you uh, at your tables our current 2010 school schedule. Uh, I ask you to take a moment to review our upcoming schools and consider attending one of them or sending a friend. Uh, it happens that we have now uh, more uh, schools already scheduled this year than at this time in any previous year, and we have considerably more students enrolled at forthcoming schools than we have ever had at this time in any previous year. Uh, I, it will be my pleasure now to introduce to you Eric Slee, who will offer an invocation and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Eric Slee is currently the Director of Communications Training Department here at the Institute. Eric was previously a legislative correspondent for Congressman Mark Green of Wisconsin's 8th Congressional District. Uh, he's raised in Watertown, Wisconsin. Eric graduated from the University of Wisconsin at Oshkosh, receiving a bachelor's degree in political science. Eric, would you come and offer an invocation, lead us in the pledge. Okay, please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, bless us as we come together in your name. <clears throat> Send the spirit of Jesus into our hearts to guide us in our discussion today and help us to work together for your honor. <clears throat> Thank you for preparing this meal for us. Thank you for the abundance of your goodness, which sustains our lives and strengthens us to serve you more effectively. Thank you for the hands that have prepared this meal and for the joy of being able to share it. For all we have received and all that is yet to come, God, we are thankful. We ask this blessing through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please join me in the, pl in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, our God, individual, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Eric. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Chris Doss, who will give a brief report on the Institute programs. Chris is a grassroots coordinator at the Leadership Institute. Chris has been a presenter and adjunct lecturer at 23 colleges and university campuses, as well as at think tanks, public affairs uh, institutions, seminars and workshops in the United States and in Europe. Uh, he has worked on political campaigns in Norway, Sweden, and Germany. Chris did his undergraduate work in political philosophy at Wake Forest University in North Carolina and graduate work in communications at the University of Oslo in Norway. Chris? Thank you. 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're staying fairly busy in grassroots right now. Uh, at this very moment, uh, Robert Arnakis, my boss, is in Nevada where he's crisscrossing the state doing about a half a dozen programs. And I don't know the exact nature of each of those programs, but I understand they have something to do with linguistics and dialectology, and Senator Harry Reid is teaching him the terminology that he's using. Um, uh, my colleague, uh, Patty Simpson, just flew off early this morning to Nashville, Tennessee, where she's going to be training at the National Tea Party Convention. You've heard that, um, uh, perhaps, you've heard that Sarah Palin is the headliner there. Uh, no, in fact, Sarah Palin is the warm-up act, not for Minnie Pearl, but for Patty Jackson, Patty Simpson, as she does her training there. Uh, if uh, Al Gore's global warming doesn't preclude it, I know you think there are no conservatives in the state of Delaware, but we have over 100 people signed up this weekend for a weekend class in Dover, Delaware this weekend. So we'll be out there. Um, in the last uh, six months, Patty, just going to Tea Party meetings, has trained over 400 astroturfers. Um, in, on the 18th and 19th, all of programs will be doing a fairly vast uh, set of trainings at CPAC. We hope you'll join us if you're going to be there. And it includes grassroots activist training, internet training, television training, public speaking, and fundraising. And as a special event for all of you and all of you only, we asked Nancy Pelosi if she could come in and teach us some flower arranging. She's going to do better than that. She's going to teach you how to hide $1,000 in cut flowers each month in your budget for your office, as she's doing. And Na Janet Napolitano is going to teach us how clever planning foiled the Christmas underwear bombing. <laughs> so we hope you'll join us for all those. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. They're really producing an immense amount of, of, uh, of training out of the grassroots department. Uh, and and let, me, let me tell you that uh, perhaps the major reason for the increase in our, our U.S. training last year uh, was the increase in interest in our schools which are campaign related. Uh, our uh, uh, justifiably uh, famed one-week school for campaign managers, which we've been holding for more than uh, 15 years, our school in er the week-long school in early December drew 112 people, which is close to twice the number that we have ever had at that school in all the years that, that we have been conducting it. And the result was that uh, we've scheduled another one of those schools for uh, this month. Uh, the, the demand is high. That, that's a very intense five-day school. I think we have 25 different lecturers uh, come to talk about uh, different aspects of uh, what campaign managers need to know. And now, to introduce our speaker, I'm going to present to you Chris Malagisi. Christopher Malagisi is the Director of Political Training here at the Leadership Institute. He is also President of the Young Conservatives Coalition, a D.C.-based young professional conservative advocacy and networking organization dedicated to organizing the next generation of the conservative movement by fostering young adult activism and public policy awareness. Uh, Chris is a political science adjunct professor at American University. He was recently awarded the 2009 Rising Star Award from Campaigns and Elections uh, Politics magazine. Uh, Chris is presently the Republican Party of Virginia's 8th Congressional District Vice Chairman, and he received a Master's of Public Administration from Syracuse University's Maxwell School of Public Affairs, and a BA in political science from American University. Chris, come introduce our outstanding speaker. Thank you very much, and good morning to everybody. Uh, it's my proud honor and privilege to introduce our guest speaker here today. 
Uh, some of you may, uh, I'm sure most of all of us know who he is and uh, definitely who he writes uh, for. Jed Babin is the editor of Human Events. Uh, he, it's America's oldest conservative journal as well as humanevents.com. He is a best-selling author of a few books, um, mostly published with Regnery Publishing, in the words of our enemies, Inside the Asylum, Why the UN and Old Europe are Worse Than You Think, and Showdown, Why China Wants War with the United States. Mr. Babin has written weekly columns for uh, various online and print publications, such as Real Clear Politics, The Washington Times, The American Spectator, and is a contributor to National Review Online as well. Mr. Babin's expertise is in national security and foreign affairs, and is a former Air Force officer who served as a deputy undersecretary in the George H.W. Bush administration. For about four years, uh, Mr. Babin has served as a designated host, guest host of Oliver North's Common Sense Radio when Colonel North uh, was unavailable. During the Iraq military campaign in 1993, he, when Mr. North uh, was unavailable, uh, he had ser he'd sit in for him for nine straight weeks, uh, filling in for him. Since then, Mr. Babin has also subbed for Laura Ingram, Hugh Hewitt, Rush Limbaugh, and Mark Levin. He has even traveled to the terrorist detention facility at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, and to Iraq in 2005. Mr. Babin is also a graduate of Stevens Institute of Technology and received a law degree from the Cumberland School of Law. Some other interesting tidbits about Mr. Babin is that he also writes for the American Spectator's Saloon series on subjects such as single barrel bourbon and fine cigars. He also wrote a military adventure novel called Legacy of Valor. Mr. Babbitt is also a military and foreign affairs analyst and appears frequently on Fox News shows such as The Riley Factor and Fox and Friends and has appeared on various CNN and MSNBC shows. One in particular I wanted to point out was a, a notable quote that I found on Wikipedia about uh, Mr. Babineau when he was on uh, Chris Matthews in 2003 talking about the lead up to the Iraq war. He had a quote uh, when talking about France and uh, the coalition of the willing or the unwilling, that going to war with, without France is like going deer hunting without an accordion. You just leave a lot of useless, noisy baggage behind. <laughs> oh, please clap. <laughs> Another one of my, I looked up some of his recent uh, op-eds that he had writ, uh, written, and there was one in particular that I thought would be interesting and very timely. He also recently wrote about the Scott Brown election in Massachusetts um, in a title entitled Return of the Bambino's Curse, where he states, for the Senate seat held since 1952 by Kennedy brothers Jack and Ted in the most liberal state in the Union is about as likely as my seeing a unicorn among the deer grazing on my farm. Mr. Babin's contributions to the conservative movement are countless, and he, is tires and he tirelessly continues to educate Americans about the principles that you and I hold dear. As he leads human events into the 21st century, he continues a tradition of, as the late President Ronald Reagan said, spreading the revolutionary news of our crusade. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Babin. Thanks, Chris. And, you know, with that kind of a lead-in, we've got to get revved up here. <laughs> All right, let's get serious. Now, he, we at Human Events, being devout conservatives, we are dedicated to changing and fixing a lot of the political problems in Washington, D.C. One of them, of course, is the lack of bipartisanship. So we have a proposal that I'm going to be sending up to Nancy Pelosi's office just later today. You're the first to hear about this. We're going to say, look, we know and you know that we have to resume waterboarding of terrorist prisoners. But in order to bring some of the liberals along, we will promise that it will only be done with Perrier. <laughs> hey, look, we've got to try, right? All right, well, let's, let's talk uh, at the risk of being serious uh, about the topic that I think should be nearest and dearest to every heart in the room. Are you safer today than you were a year ago? Is your nation safer? We're going to talk a little bit, too, about the economics of this and the fact that you know, this is really not going to hurt me very much, and, and Mort and Helen and, and some of the people who are over 30. Uh, but those of you who are under 30 uh, are going to face a reduced economy in a way which is going to affect your lives directly. And you'd better be concerned about where this economy is going, because it's your money that they're dealing with. Let's go right back to national security first. Let me suggest to you that for as many things as the Bush administration did wrong, and there were legion and many, 
that you have a situation now where a president of the United States is taking actions, not neglecting things, but taking affirmative actions that are reducing our nation's security. And by his actions, he will cost American lives here and abroad. Let me just run through a couple of them. We had a huge debate over the past few years regarding the so-called enhanced interrogation techniques, the things that ranged from the outrage of a belly slap to waterboarding. Uh, the law was changed several times, and thanks to Senator McCain's amendment, uh, we now really don't know what the heck torture is. But the basic bottom line is that, number one, when waterboarding was being used in 2003 and up to almost 2004, uh, it was legal. It was not torture. It was legal under American law. The other things we're talking about, walling someone, tossing him up against a flexible wall to startle him, things of those natures produced better intelligence from terrorist detainees than we got from any other source. And that's not just my opinion. You might recall, I think about three years ago, George Tenet, thank heaven he's no longer the director of the CIA, but when he was, he said very clearly that the enhanced interrogation techniques gave us more and valuable, more valuable intelligence than everything the CIA, NSA, and FBI did combined. One of the first things that Obama did coming into the presidency was to ban the enhanced interrogation techniques, leaving us necessarily with less intelligence, less effective means of gathering intelligence. And what does that do? Of course, it raises our danger here. You saw something yesterday. Well, fortunately, you probably didn't. You actually have real lives. Um, I watch this stuff so you don't have to. <sighs> yesterday, there was yet another hearing in the Senate about what is to be done with terrorist prisoners. And uh, Senator McCain, in one of his moments, uh, actually asked a very good question of Director of National Intelligence, Dennis Blair. He said, well, now we've gone through this exercise with the underwear bomber. Would we, if we captured Osama bin Laden today, would we read him as Miranda writes? Osama bin Laden, of course, has no right to draw another breath far less be protected from the vicissitudes of the American criminal justice system. Dennis Blair refused to answer. That's where we are. We went to war in October of 2001. Our military responded fast and hard and well to the president's decision to go to war in Afghanistan. Why? After, after the Taliban regime there refused to turn Osama bin Laden over. You may not remember, but George Bush gave them an ultimatum and gave them 48 hours to respond and say, give us this guy or we're coming for him. And they refused, and then we went to war. Now, the guy we went to war to capture or kill, the Director of National Intelligence is saying, well, maybe we ought to Mirandize him and let him lawyer up. Um, I don't think so, ladies and gentlemen, which brings me to the second, of course, big danger to our national security. That is a result of an affirmative action by President Obama. You have this confusion, and it's really, I don't believe a confusion, it's confusion in logic, but it is a determination that they have made that terrorists should be treated like Beverly Hills purse snatchers. These people do not understand, these people, this Obama administration, I really believe they do understand. Let me take that back. They do understand what they're doing. They understand and firm, fervently believe that treating terrorists as criminals rather than as enemy combatants is something that should be done. Now, who's pleased by that? Well, the terrorists, the nations that sponsor terrorism, and quite frankly, all the European snobs and peck sniffs who he apparently wants to appeal to. This is what we get from President Obama. Now we have that decision to treat these people like criminals, and that leads to several things. It leads to the closure of Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. It leads to the business of releasing many of the Gitmo inmates to nations which are not fit to receive them. Quite frankly, let me just take a step back. There is no legal reason for us to be closing Gitmo or releasing these people at all. Again, under the United States Constitution, under 221 years of American statutory law, under the law of war, as reflected in the Geneva Conventions of 1949, there is no reason compelling us to do that. These determinations by, by President Obama are entirely political. They are not by law. 
They are not for any other reason. And if you look at the, the often broadcast reason for doing so, for closing Gitmo, that it's a recruitment for terrorists, well, let me tell you one thing. I uh, had the good fortune to talk to uh, former Attorney General Mike McCasey a couple of weeks ago at a conference we were both speaking at in New York City. And I asked him about that, and he just said, baloney, or words to that effect. Uh, General McCasey said that uh, the best recruitment tool for terrorists is a successful attack. There's another one I would mention to you. There is an ideology called radical Islam, and it's important for us to distinguish between the religion of Islam and the ideology of radical Islam. One is different from the other. Radical Islam being a radical ideology is something we need to defeat in the war of ideas, which we're not doing. But having said all of that, <coughs> stepping back, there are two recruitment tools for terrorism. Not Gitmo is not on the list. You have successful attacks and the radical Islamist ideology. That's all there is. This whole business of saying that Gitmo is a recruitment tool for terrorism is balderdash. This is what we're getting from this president. There are other things that he has been doing that also reduce your safety. Releasing people from Gitmo to nations such as Yemen. Well, it's just so wonderful that our president has decided to suspend, to suspend, not end, but suspend transfers of Gitmo inmates to Yemen. Yemen, where it is a failed state, where on the Saudi border, where the Al-Qaeda for the Arabian Peninsula pretty much holds free sway, except for the people who are now getting swatted by uh, some of our special forces over there. You know, this is the place to which Mr. Obama still is considering releasing Gitmo inmates. We know, we know that at least 20 percent of the uh, hundreds of people who have left Gitmo have gone back to terrorism. Some have been recaptured, some have been killed, some are suspected of terrorist activity. This is something that decreases the danger, or decreases the, the safety of Americans around the world. Last but not least, and I don't want to go into all the details because I could go on for a day and a half with this, the issue of how our intelligence community is suffering under the Obama administration. You have a situation where after the 9-11 Commission put forward its recommendations, we did something very bad. Uh, not bad in the sense of, of with malice of forethought, but something that foreseeably was dumb. We created another bureaucratic layer over the intelligence community. It's called the Director of National Intelligence. The aforementioned Dennis Blair now sits in that chair. Uh, it did not unify the intelligence community, and our people are still pretty well blind to what's going on in nice places such as Iran. We need to fix this, and we need to fix it now. Instead of fixing it, we have a Speaker of the House, an Attorney General, and, I'm sad to say, a President, uh, all of whom are at war with the intelligence community. Nancy Pelosi has called the CIA a bunch of liars more than once, and, quite frankly, has never withdrawn that. Eric Holder has a special prosecutor out there still investigating as to whether they're going to prosecute people who were CIA terrorist interrogators for so-called abuse of prisoners. And we also have the issue of President Obama, again, not standing up for the people on the front line. Now, you can picture a CIA agent in a lot of different ways. A lot of different ways. All right, everybody's seen James Bond movies, and hey, it'd be really cool to be a spy, you know, driving an Aston Martin DB9 down a narrow mountain road with some gorgeous chick on the next seat. You know, that sounds pretty good. Uh, but that's not the life of a CIA agent. The CIA agent is more likely to be draped in, draped in uh, polar fleece, sitting on a dirt floor of a hut in Afghanistan, talking to a local sheik. They're a lot of them very brave, they're a lot of them very skilled, and they're going in harm's way. You want to look at what happened to Johnny Michael Spann, the first casualty in the Afghanistan war. He was killed when prisoners, Taliban prisoners, uh, took a chance to revolt and rebel at the uh, Masri Sharif fort that had been previously captured by special forces. These are the people who are defending us. These are the people who the president should be standing up for, and he is not. Let me, before we go to questions, and I want to get to a lot of that, I know we've got one of our star new reporters for human events here in the audience, and I know Allison's going to ask a question. Uh, but the point I wanted to make is the economic point. You look at what's going on right now. We have a false recovery. I don't know how many of you read uh, Don Lambro's great column in Human Events last week 
Uh, Don, former Wash Times writer, uh, like many of the Wash Times people you used to enjoy, they're now at least part-time writing for us at Human Events. The uh, point of his column was an interview with Art Laffer, Re Ronald Reagan's favorite economist. And what uh, Laffer was saying, I think, is demonstrably true. We are now in a false recovery. The nation's economy is coming up a bit. We saw, what, a 5% growth in the last, uh, last quarter. But what's going to happen come 1st of 2011? We're going to have the Bush tax uh, cuts expire. So taxes are going to go up for everybody. Capital gains taxes go up, hurting business and business investment. And estate taxes go up, hurting those people who need to inherit businesses and farms and so forth. We're going to be hit by an economic tidal wave that's going to be worse than what we saw last year. And all of this is going to come at a time when you, the younger folks around here, need to really be most concerned. You are the people who are at risk. You are not going to have the standard of living that your parents did. You're not going to be able to buy that Porsche. You're not going to have as big a house as your parents bought because the dollar is going to be worth less. Think about this. In 2020, on the way we are going right now, just 10 years from now, on this path, the government spending will be, actually the deficit, I believe, will be 75% of the gross domestic product. Three quarters of every dollar that this country produces will be spent by the government. You people, right now, and I know more, this is the intention of, of the Leadership Institute, you people, need to be revved up. You need to get out there. You need to get off your butts and get involved in political campaigns every month, every day, every hour. You can possibly do it, and even more so this year. Hey, it's your future that these folks are messing with. It's your lives. It's your children's lives. This economy is at stake, and we are on the brink of something that we have not seen since the 1930s. I am not necessarily all doom and gloom. But I've got to tell you, I've got to call it as I see it. And you know what? If it's, if it's Art Laffer who is predicting things like this, I can't ignore that. Well, let me uh, end on a higher note and just say we've got more good people in our military right now, more good people in the CIA. Let them do their jobs. Let them win. And we can fix this, and we can make America safer, and we can protect our children and our children's fortunes. This is all doable, ladies and gentlemen. The, the battle is not over, and we're not going to quit. Well, thank you very much. Let's get some questions. Anybody and everybody. I knew it. Allison Epperson is one of our newest writers at Human Events. She is a Hello. terrific writer. Thanks. And you need to read ADP Epperson on humanevents.com. Thanks, Jen. Good morning, Al. Good morning. Um, okay, I have a question that's, I mean, I'm going to start with a not pleasant one. The, Re the Republican Party arguably has failed miserably in getting through, I mean, getting elections, getting elected, getting the message out. I mean, I hate to say that, but we, we usually win by, you know, default. And, and that's not a good thing. That's not how you go about, you know, propagating your message. What's the solution? What is your solution? Well, I, I don't claim to be, uh, you know, the ultimate oracle on this, but I, I do think that the Republican Party does not yet understand that the Tea Party movement is representative of something that's much larger and more important than either party. I think you have millions of people around this country who are now politically active who have never been active before. And I think if you look at the demographics, everything we have learned about the Tea Party movement over the past year, these are independents. These are people who have never before gone to a political rally. I mean, I, I don't know how many of you guys have... Anybody here been to one of the Tea Party rallies? Okay. Well, I've been through just two of them. But I've walked through the crowds and I've talked to people. I said, you know, when was the last time you voted? Uh, I think I voted in 92. You know, that's the kind of response you get. People are angry, and they're angry at all the politicians. Republicans can take no comfort in the fact that they are, the Tea Partiers and others are angry at the Democrats. The answer, I think, is to reach out to the Tea Partiers. I will tell you, without mentioning names, I had a conference call with seven Republican state chairmen 
about two months ago, and I asked them, what are you doing in your state to reach out and turn the Tea Party enthusiasm into Republican votes in the fall? The answer was dead silence on the other end of the line. Uh, I think people need to, again, from the younger people in the party, the younger conservatives, you can change this. Go to meetings, rattle cages, saying, we've got to go do this. What are you doing on Facebook? What are you doing on Twitter? What are you doing to reach out to these young folks? How many people are you going to send to that Tea Party rally? You know, if you don't shake the cage, nothing's going to happen. But I think that, at least, is the long-term answer. I don't know if there is a short-term answer. I, I'm hopeful the Republicans make big gains this year, uh, but never, never presume. Yes, sir. Yesterday, the uh, underwear bomber came out that he, you know, he's cooperating without being pressured, etc. Supposedly giving good information, etc. And Rachel Maddow and the rest of them are all now saying, "Gee, why?" So, what's the response? Well, number one, I do not believe for one minute that his cooperation is complete or as complete or as timely as it could have and should have been a month or so ago if his sorry butt was dragged off to Gitmo and put in a cell as it should have been. This man should not be in civilian custody. To answer Maddow in that crowd, what you have to look at is what is the circumstance of the information he's now giving. Is it too late, too old? He's giving it in terms of obtaining a plea bargain with our government to get a lesser charge so that he can go back to uh, whatever he's doing in Yemen and uh, get trained to do another better bombing. The, bo the basic point is the information which we're getting now is being sold, not obtained. It's being obtained by people who are not trained to get intelligence information. You know, any good detective will go out when a suspect says something, go out and try to verify it. But when you have real experts, and I've been to Gitmo, I've seen the people there, I've talked to a lot of them. You know, I'm sure it's changed over in personnel since I was there. But the basic bo bottom line is these are people who are, a lot of them, Arab linguists, a lot of them who have very rich cultural history, exposure to these people, and they know what goes on. Plus, they're intelligence experts. They can plug in different pieces of the puzzle. They will have been briefed on what other terrorist suspects have said. They may have questioned the others themselves, and they can put the pieces together. What we're doing here with Abdul Muttalib, again, is dangerous to the United States of America. It is indicative of a, an affirmative decision by this president to not treat these people as enemies. This is a fundamental mistake. It will cost American lives. Lady in the back. Wait, wait for a microphone. You're kind of a soft-spoken lady. Good morning. My, thanks for joining us, Mr. Babin. My name is Giselle. Um, my question to you is, considering that the system is obviously um, turned upside down with our intelligence and military, um, I wanted to ask you, where do you think the gap um, between the communication of the CIA and the military in regards to two situations with the underwear bomber's um, father coming to the CIA and warning us, hey, look, here's my son, he's going to do this. And um, my second question is, is the seven men that were in, it's slipping my mind now, where they were, that, that were CIA agents that um, were bombed by a guy who, Afghanistan? Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> please forgive me, but um, I wanted to add, my question is, how, how are we m missing this? Because as normal people here, we're intelligent, we're logical, and we see that this is obviously not correct, and we trust these people with our lives and with our safety, and why is that gap, and where is the miscommunication? Coming? That's a really good question, and thanks for it, Giselle. I mean, there's, there's lots of gaps. Uh, the gap is in the intelligence community, and it comes back to what we did after the 9-11 Commission report. Uh, the basic problem was we put in this Director of National Intelligence, which is just a bureaucratic overlay over 15, 16 different intelligence agencies. Let me tell you a little story about what the real solution is. Back in 1980, was it four or five or six, Mort, when we, uh, when we went into Grenada? I, I think it was 1984. 
Uh, 83, I'm sorry. Okay, I knew Mort would remember. He's, he said, there you go. Well, the Grenada invasion, thank heaven, was not opposed seriously because when we went in there, uh, the Air Force couldn't talk to the Marines on the ground because their radios wouldn't switch to the same frequencies. The Army was conducting their own invasion. Nobody knows what the hell they were doing. And the Navy, well, the Navy was circling around the island looking really, really, really dangerous. So the basic point was a bunch of folks came back and said, no, we're not going to do this. We're going to integrate our armed forces. Barry Goldwater got together with a fellow by the name of Bill Nichols, who was the ranking Republican on the Armed Services Committee on the House side, and they came up with what's called the Goldwater-Nichols Act. It forces joint operations. What is that? It makes everybody cooperate. By law, people share information. They share people. They share missions. Everything works together. So when you have a joint operation, we now have literally what we call network-centric warfare. If you can't plug into the computer systems like the French can't, we don't even want you on the battlefield. You're just going to get in the way. The point of the matter is jointness, an awkward word even by Pentagon standards, was forced on the military, and it works. It's almost like a religion there now. What we needed to do, and I wrote at the time, I'm very proud of this, I said we do not need a director of national intelligence. We need in a jointness statute like Goldwater Nichols to be forced upon the intelligence community. And unfortunately, though, some people who really wanted to do this, like uh, Senator Pat Roberts of Kansas, I don't know how many of you even know of Pat. Uh, he was ranking on intelligence back then. He was one smart son of a gun. Uh, they really wanted to do that, but it just never happened. So that's the gap. Right now, when someone like uh, Abdul Muttalib's father wanders into the State Department, not any other place, he wanders into the State Department, the State Department has its own intelligence organization. Think about that for a while. But the basic bottom line is that information may or may not reach the FBI. The FBI, God bless them, I love these guys, I got a lot of FBI friends, but they're still playing cops and robbers. They still don't get the intel game. And, you know, they'll kind of look at it and say, ah, oh, you know, maybe this is enough. We have a system right now, I'm getting on too long in response to your question, but forgive me. We have a situation right now where there is an absolute prejudice against putting someone on the no-fly list. You have to have four or five different elements that are satisfied. You've got people who have to you know, go back and forth and verify things. Hey, it should be really easy to get on the no-fly list. If somebody comes in and says, my son is in Yemen and he may be exposed to radicalists, I don't know what to do, you know, I'm a concerned dad. Bang, no fly list. And you know what? He doesn't get off it until he proves that he can be trusted. What we do is just the opposite. Again, we are, we, we are losing lives because of political correctness. We should be doing behavioral profiling at airports. The Israelis do it very well. Costs some money, takes a long time to develop. Hey, when was the last time an El Al airliner was hijacked? 1972 or three, something like that? Hey, it works. It's a long answer to a short question. The gaps are enormous. We did not learn the lessons that 9-11 taught us. We did not fix what was broken. Yes, sir. Um, considering the, the new budget that's been proposed by our president and uh, uh, right now he's campaigning all over the country talking about how we need to bring down the deficit and yet the deficit in the budget at what 1.6 trillion is higher than it's ever been um, should it be uh, should the Republicans in the Senate should they filibuster against this budget um, and whether or not they should will they and what can we do to try and influence this Let me try out a new line on you uh, Barack Obama preaching fiscal responsibility is like a Frenchman preaching bravery and loyalty uh, you know, basically, you've got, that's not as good as the earlier one. <laughs> Why? What? Okay. What, what were they resistant to? You know, more expensive wine? Come on. You know, the, the, point, the point really comes back to this is damaging our economy. The, the Republicans absolutely should try to filibuster it. I don't think they'll be successful, but you never know. 
the point of the matter is that spending is, you can't even say that it's out of control and even adequately describe it. This is a runaway train which is going to result in a devaluation of the dollar and a reduction in the American standard of living for decades, maybe forever. I think you need to get involved. Every last one of you can be writing your congressman. I mean, go to Tea Party movement. Start your own Tea Party. Start an economic Tea Party. You know, you've got the Tea Party, comma, health care, one each. All right, let's start Tea Party, comma, economics, one each. I mean, you've got to... You've got to rev people up every single day. You've got to be talking about this. I mean, to talk to the folks on the Hill is a good thing. And to talk to the Republicans, of course. To talk to the Democrats, you should do it too. But I'll tell you right now, there are people out there, like Senator Claire McCaskill of Missouri, who are literally turning off the phones and not talking to constituents. That message needs to get out too. These people don't want to listen. Yes, sir. So let's change the topic for a minute, the gays in the military. As a former naval career uh, officer, I you know, lived through the 1993 debacle of President Clinton trying to do that, and now they're going through it again. Secretary of Defense and Chairman of Joint Chiefs just came out saying they're going to look into it, and they're you know, siding towards it. The question, though, is how within the, in the ranks I know firsthand that, that you know, good order and discipline will be, it'll be detrimental to that. But... They're, you know, they follow the strict chain of command, and so they don't, they can't be too political. But how, how do, how do they, or how can we as conservatives, you know, uh, bring them into the the conversation to say no? You can't really bring active duty military into the political situation. I mean, you know, I've been there myself as an Air Force officer. You can't be political. That's part of our democracy. You know, the separation of powers and all the rest of that. But the basic bottom line here is this is a done deal unless one thing happens. The only thing that can stop this train is to get a bunch of good senior generals and admirals to say, I will resign if this gets changed. You've got an active duty people. If they don't have the guts to do that, and I bet they don't. You saw Mike Mullen, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs up there uh, yesterday. Yeah, I know, look, this is bad. Uh, this is going to happen. What's gonna happen, of course, is the same thing that the people who don't respect the military have seen as a result of other actions. You're going to see, th this is an all-volunteer force, folks. You know, if they don't like it, they're going to vote with their feet. People are not going to re-enlist. People are not going to join up. And, you know, if you can't, I mean, you don't have privacy. I mean, I was an Air Force officer. We had hot showers, and, you know, I had a very nice apartment in Sacramento, California, which is as far as, as close as I ever got to anything dangerous. But the basic point of the matter is even the fly guys who were over in Vietnam at the time were, you know, they had, they had a decent life. They weren't out in the, in the mud with the grunts. When you're out there, you don't have personal privacy. You don't have a situation where you can be alone or, or have something to yourself. And if you have someone there who is a sexual disturbance, that's going to affect morale, it's going to affect unit cohesion, it's going to affect the ability of that force to fight. And the, the troops are not stupid. The troops get it. They understand what's going to change in their lives and in the atmosphere in which they fight. And they're not going to like it a whole lot, ladies and gentlemen. This is going to be a very bad thing for our military. Again, the only way to stop this, and I'd, I'd love to have a lot of people out there and, and you know, talking about it and marching about it, the only thing that's going to stop this is if a couple of guys with stars on their shoulders have the guts to resign over it, and I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, Mort. Many of us in this room became conservative activists in the Goldwater upsurge. Helen and I and other, others that I know who are here in those days, uh, Human Events and National Review were just about the only uh, communications vehicles that conservatives had to spread our ideas, spread our in interpretation of the news. The left had almost complete control of all the methods of mass communications and, and rapid communications. Um, and we worked hard at the grassroots and finally put together a, a, a successful movement. Um, the situation with respect to communications of conservative principles, ideas, interpretations of what's going on is, has obviously shifted. 
It's a better situation now. I'd like your thought as a professional in the field as to, as to what is the balance now. Do you think we have uh, uh, approximately the equivalent capabilities that the left has? And do you think that this balance of communication abilities is it currently improving for the conservatives or is it, has it stabilized? Question. Let me let me first say, I think we're not quite to the point where we are equal to the liberals, but I think we're coming up fast. And if things go the right way, if we're smart about it, we're going to surpass them. What you have is a situation where the liberals still dominate the major broadcast networks. What we have, you know, to a degree, we have Fox News, we have talk radio, and we have publications like Human Events, and there's a lot of blogs out there. <clears throat> Pardon me. What we need to do more and more is rely on what's called the social media. Now, one of the things that I am, as a professional journalist, most distraught about is that young people won't pay for news. They just simply will not subscribe. God bless Mary. She went and found me a Wall Street Journal this morning. You know, I can't really go through my morning without getting through the Wall Street Journal, especially the editorial page. But the basic bottom line is younger people, people under 30, don't want to pay for this stuff. So what you've got to do is you've got to be out on the Internet and you've got to be on the social network. A lot of people now are catching on in the conservative movement. If you look at my Twitter page, I mean, a year ago I didn't know what the heck Twitter was. Right now, I've got a Twitter page, and if you follow Jed Babin on Twitter, you'll not only see me, but you'll see Congressman Tom Price, the uh, chairman of the Republican Study Committee, the conservative coven in the House. You'll see Mike Pence. You'll see Jeb Henserling. You'll see a lot of the leading conservatives going up with their little short bursts. That's what it's about. What we've got to do is be better and faster, Mort. And I think we're getting there very, very quickly. A lot of young conservatives that I talk to, they get it a lot better than I do. They understand the power of the Internet. They understand the power, God help us, of the BlackBerry and the iPhone and all the rest of this stuff. And, you know, it may be that that's where we go. Twitter, you're limited to 140 characters. Look, I'm an old trial lawyer. I can barely clear my throat in 140 words, <clears throat> far less 140 characters. But I'm learning. This old dog is learning new tricks. But that's where we've got to be, every last one of us. And talk radio, the more you listen to it, the more you participate in it. You know, I've got to tell you, as a guy who's been on both sides of the microphone, <clears throat> as a guest and as, as a frequent guest host, it's the most fun you can have. I mean, as, you know, pardon me, ladies, but it's the most fun you can have with your clothes on. It is just a hoot to be on talk radio. And that's the reason why liberal talk radio doesn't work, because it's dull. It's dogmatic. It's not fun. Conservatives are fun. Conservative talk radio is the biggest political weapon we have. Call. Support. If you get a chance on your campus radio station, get behind the microphone. You'd be surprised how early, easy it is. <clears throat> Over ten years ago when I first subbed for Ollie North, for example, Ollie's show is long gone, but when I first subbed, I subbed for Ollie. And the first time I went in there, you know, the producer, a friend of mine, called up and said, hey, you know, Ollie's out. Uh, you've been a guest so many times, you want to sub? Yeah, okay, sure. So I'm sitting there, and I'm oh, my God, I'm going to do, I'm going to talk for three hours. What in blazes am I? I was petrified. And the show started, and I started talking, and people started calling in, and we had a couple of guests. And, you know, it's a three-hour show. It started at 3 o'clock. Well, next time I look at the clock, it's 10 minutes to 6. And I'm sitting here saying, hey, I'm not done yet. Wait a minute. I want another hour. <clears throat> It's electric. It is fun. Get involved with that stuff. Even if it's just to call in and make a point on a good show, there's lots of good shows out there. Do it. I think that's a long answer to a short question, but I'm excited about this. If people don't want to buy print, they'll read it on the net. If people don't want to have it in long, long, long doses, we'll boil it down for them. We're going to make this work. Conservatism is a political force because we can communicate. Yes, sir.
It's what we do. Everybody, you know, it's just don't leave it to this old goat. You know, you all get involved too. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I was wondering what your opinion of the uh, Fort Hood report was. We knew what Fort Hood report was going to say shortly after uh, the Fort Hood shooting. And I say that advisedly. And I say this with, with some anger. The Fort Hood report is a sham. It goes through, I don't know how many hundreds of pages without mentioning Islam or the fact that this guy was a jihadi. Uh, when you have a chief of staff of the United States Army, and I, <clears throat> I, I've known George Casey, pardon me. <clears throat> Coffee is the answer regardless of what the question is. Uh, I've known George Casey. I've dined with him in his quarters in Baghdad when he was commander over there. Uh, but after the Fort Hood shooting, when you have the chief of staff of the United States Army saying, as much of a tragedy as this was, it would be an even greater tragedy if the Army's diversity were harmed, that man is not fit to serve. And I think we have to recognize that if you are not going to protect the force, again, this is an all-volunteer force. The troops are not stupid. They get it. If you think that diversity is more important than their lives, they're going to resign. They're not going to re-enlist. We have a politically correct leadership right now in this military, which is <clears throat> dangerous to our future. And I think the Fort Hood report is, is just another piece of evidence to, to support that. I think we've got time for one or two more. Yes, sir. Just this week, uh, the website Atlas Shrugged featured a detailed discussion of the Obama for America indoctrination program for our high school students, calling on high school students to enlist for a 10-week course as an intern, devoting 12 hours a week to the elevation of everything that Obama believes in. Is there any way that we can counteract that? And I wonder how familiar you are you with that program. I'm familiar with that right now, but I'll tell you, right now, sitting here, is what we're doing, is we're counteracting that. You know, we're reaching out to young people, and we're getting through to people of the force and logic and reason and facts behind conservatism. I mean, fact-based conservatism is an oxymoron. Fact-based liberalism does not exist. So I think the younger people get that. All we need to do is to do more like what Mort's doing, you know, what other people around the country are doing, what we're going to be doing a couple of weeks at CPAC. Anybody here going to CPAC? All right. Well, we'll be there 24-7. And really, this is what we need to be doing. We need to do more of it. You know, I'm hopeful that after CPAC is over, we're going to have some follow through with the young folks. The, the, what they're doing with the Obama training program is nothing new. I mean, the Soviets did it with Komsomol. Right now, I mean, it exists in California already. I mean, if you get raised in the California school systems and then you go to Berkeley, you don't need further liberal indoctrination. That's, this is going on all over the place, but a lot of good people are out there. A lot of good conservatives are now getting a good foothold in academia. I'm, I'm frankly not too worried about that stuff. I think we have time for one more. I want to ask you about um, modernizing our nuclear arsenal. I know um, it's been an issue for a couple of years now, and um, Secretary Gates talked about it a couple of years ago before Obama came in. Uh, just recently, uh, they were talking about increasing the budget for it, modernizing it a little bit. Um, what do you, what's your take on that? Is that a good first step? Is that just politics? What was your take on that? I think it's halfway measures. I think it's something we need to do. Uh, we haven't tested an underground test, I think, for almost 20 years, maybe even a little bit more. Uh, the basic bottom line is we need to take that as part of the whole recapitalization issue. Uh, the Air Force now is going to be short 700 fighters. Uh, we've got tankers that are now an average 47 years old. Uh, the Navy is down to, I guess, just around 300 ships. Uh, we are in a position now where our forces are tremendously weakened by decades of neglect. I wish I could say this is just all uh, Obama or Clinton, but it's not. I mean, the last time we had a, a significant recapitalization of our force, buying new stuff and retiring old stuff, goes back to the second Reagan term. Uh, we need to get our act together on this. We need to do it fast. I'll tell you right now, with one closing thought, America is a superpower for a lot of reasons, 
but we cannot be a superpower without those nasty old smelly Air Force tankers. You think of the first thing that happens whenever an international crisis goes on, a humanitarian crisis, whatever, the tankers go up because that enables cargo aircraft, attack aircraft, fighters, bombers, everything. Nothing goes. Not one pound of clean water, not one bullet. Nothing goes without those tankers. 47 years old right now, on average, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, I really appreciate the invitation today. Mort, Helen, thank you both very much. I really do appreciate it, and I uh, hope I'll uh, be able to talk to you again soon. See you at CPAC, folks. We really, really appreciate that. What a wonderful wealth of experience uh, that you have, wonderful uh, breadth of expertise, and you're a great communicator, uh, not only in print and on TV, but uh, here at a breakfast. Uh, as a token of our appreciation, let me uh, present to you uh, one of our uh, Adam Smith ties. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. I've got a couple of these at home from, from earlier years, and my wife keeps telling me that they're worn out, so this would be a welcome addition. Well, even, even the best quality, and certainly our ties are the best quality ties, eventually uh, do uh, wear out, but fortunately, Leadership Institute can supply uh, uh, new ones of equally high quality. I invite everybody, please, to join us on Wednesday, March the 3rd. Uh, our Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfast will feature Mr. Larry Pratt, Executive Director of Gun Owners of America. Larry and I have been friends for more than 40 years. Larry has been part of the, the growth of the, of the conservative movement. He speaks uh, every semester to our interns, and there are always some interns who at the end of the session say, uh, the, and, and they, they have weekly uh, at least weekly speakers come to, to our interns and have d dinner with them at our intern house. And there are always some interns who will say their very favorite speaker uh, that came, came to speak to them was Larry Pratt. And uh, I it would like you also to consider attending our May 5th breakfast, which, uh, when, at which our featured speaker will be Senator Jim DeMint of South Carolina. Anyone who is interested in a tour of the Institute building uh, should uh, come up here to uh, the lectern as soon as I adjourn. And Seth Nichols, Seth, where are you? Uh, Seth will be happy to give you a tour of the facility. And you, know, you might want to delay your walk out into this snow for a little while and take a tour. And Seth is just the guy to give it to you. Thank you all for coming. Come back soon.